Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. One thing I want us to see this morning as it relates to the birth of Jesus Christ, how it all happened, God's original intention for man was that the man should be in the garden that he planted himself. But something tragic happened. Man was driven out of the garden. And today the Spirit of God is saying, I want to lead you back to the garden. Because that is the main reason why Jesus Christ came. The first Adam failed. He was born again from life unto death. But I want us to see something significant that happened and is still happening. And if we are not conscious of that fact, we will not be able to stay in the garden even when we get back to the garden. Because the beginning of getting back to the garden is when you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, when you make him your personal Lord and Savior, then you are now qualified to go back to the garden. But when you get back to the garden and make the same mistakes that Adam and Eve made, you will find out that you will not be able to have dominion and authority, which was God's original intention for us. Are you getting me this morning? So we are not just going to be celebrating Christmas like the religious people. We want to know the importance of the birth of Jesus Christ. Why is it significant? Why he came? And what was he able to accomplish? Is it just rice and stew? The answer is no. So let's quickly go to Genesis chapter 2. I want to establish certain things this morning so that any time we are celebrating Christmas, we will know what we are celebrating. Genesis chapter 2. And verse 15, the Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and care for it. Verse 16, but the Lord God gave him this warning. He did what? The first thing God did was to place man in the garden. Who planted the garden? God did. And he placed him there for a purpose, for him to tend and care for it. In other words, God placed Adam there to manage the garden. That is the main reason why God created the human race, to manage this planet Earth, not just to worship him. The main purpose is for us to manage. So anytime you feel managing, you're going to lose the garden. That means that anything you fail to manage, whether it's your family, whether it's your studies, you're going to lose that thing. Are you getting me? If you don't manage the opportunities given to you, you will lose that opportunity. But, verse 16, the Lord God gave him this warning. That means he told him certain things that he must adhere to. You may freely eat any fruit in the garden, except fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Have you seen it there? Then verse 17, we are still reading, If you eat of its fruit, you will surely die. You've seen it there? You will do what? you will surely die. God is always faithful and true to his word. And I, I want to believe in my heart that Adam took him seriously. Then one chapter later, something happened. So let's quickly go to chapter 3.
I will begin to read from verse 1. It says that now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the creatures that the Lord had made. Really? He asked the woman. Did God really say you must not eat of any of the fruit in the garden? I want to stop there. What was he introducing? He was introducing doubt. He came up with his own suggestion. He gave the woman the opportunity to think about it. The lesson you take from here is that you must be careful what you listen to. The suggestions that you listen to. And that is the enemy's number one weapon that he uses to suggest. He will suggest something to you. And in most cases, that suggestion will create what I call credibility gap. Something that will bring about doubt for you to doubt the word of God. What was the devil challenging? What God said, don't eat of this fruit. Any day you eat of it, you're going to do what? You're going to die. So the woman thought about it. You know the rest of the story. Verse 6. The woman was convinced the fruit looked fresh and delicious. Remember, this fruit had always been there. But not until the enemy came and made that suggestion, she now took time to think about it. And for the first time, she saw it in a different light. That this fruit looks so fresh, not just fresh, so fresh and delicious. And it will make her so wise. So she ate some of the fruit. Because the devil told him, don't mind God, that any day that you eat of this fruit, your eyes will open. You will get to know what is good and evil. Tell me, what is the importance of her getting to know what is good and what is evil? It was absolutely not important. But you see, the very moment suggestions are made, that's why it's important, the kind of friends that you keep, when they begin to come up with their suggestions, when they begin to come up with their opinions, remember that anything that runs contrary to the will of the Father for your life, once you embark on it, it will be to your own disadvantage. It will lead to your destruction. Because God is faithful and true to his word. Are you hearing me? So God's original intention was that man should be in the garden and enjoy the fruit of his own level. Remember, he was the one that planted the garden and placed man in there. But now the enemy came in and made suggestions. And based on that suggestion, the woman acted, got the husband to also comply. And you all know the story. But look at something I want to bring out. In verse 15, you know how God came at the cool of the evening and called Adam and said, where are you? And Adam said, I'm hiding. He said, ah, why are you hiding? He said, because I'm naked. Remember, they were not conscious of their nakedness before this time. And even when they became conscious of their nakedness, what was it that they did? They went and brought some leaves to cover their nakedness. Tell me ordinarily, how many days will it take the leaves to dry up? In less than 10 days, that leaf will be useless. It wouldn't be able to fulfill the intended intention. Am I right? But what was it that God did? He slew some animal, took their skin, with the blood still dripping on it, he used it to cover them, to show how ugly that stain is. 
to also show that without the shedding of blood, there wouldn't be any remittance of sin. Are you getting it? But that's not where I'm going. Look at what God said in verse 15. He said, from now on, he was telling the devil, you and the woman will be enemies. And your offspring and her offspring will be enemies. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. What offspring was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus Christ. So do you see why it became necessary that Christ had to come? Because of the fall of man. So anytime we're celebrating Christmas, we must be conscious of the fact that this day became necessary because of the fall of man. That man had lost God's original intention to be at the garden. And if you're a Christian, what this day simply means is that you have the opportunity of staying in the garden where God had prepared for you. So if things are not working according to your plans, if things are not working out the way that you think it should work, Walk back to the garden. There is a place for every child of God in the garden. Is that okay? There is a place. And that is the main reason why Jesus Christ came. So now, Isaiah prophesied, he said, in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, he said, unto us a child is born. And unto us a son is given. And the government will rest on his shoulders. These will be his royal titles. The first one is Wonderful Counselor. The second one is Mighty God, the third one is Everlasting Father, the fourth one is the Prince of Peace. He says that his ever-expanding peaceful government will never end. He will rule forever with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestor David. He says the passionate commitment of the Lord Almighty will guarantee this. He said his kingdom will continue to expand. So as many people that give their lives to Jesus Christ, they bring about the expansion of the kingdom of God. Amen? So Christmas, as we know it today, is all about the birth of Jesus Christ. Why? Because of the fall of man. God had to put a redemption plan in place the very day that man fell. As soon as Adam and Eve missed it, God came up with a redemption plan. He said the seed of the woman is going to bruise your head. He was talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. And thousands of years later, Jesus Christ showed up on the scene. But you see, his birth, fine, it's significant. But his life itself was what made the difference. If he had failed like Adam did, then every hope of redemption could have been lost. But thank God that he succeeded in life. And why was he able to succeed? He remained focused. He said, I've not come to do my will, but I've come to do the will of the Father that sent me. To the extent that the Garden of Gethsemane, when the temptation was so severe, he said, 
Father, how I wish that this cup will pass away from me. But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he was able to succeed at Calvary. And before he gave up the ghost, he said, it is what? It's finished. What was finished? That means that this assignment, I've been able to complete it. And that assignment was that through him, reconciliation will come to humanity. So the birth of Jesus Christ is what brought about peace. We, are, we now have the opportunity to be reconciled back to, to God because we are told in 2 Corinthians, I think chapter 5, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling himself back to humanity. And that's exactly what makes the difference for us to realize that God is no longer angry with us. God is at peace with us all because of what Jesus Christ did. That's the significance of his birth. He was able to conquer the enemy. He was able to reestablish the way back to the garden. And that was why he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father except what? Except through me. So, when you realize that, at every point in life, that Jesus Christ is the one that can lead you back to the garden. But remember that he's no longer here on earth. He's in heaven as our high priest, making intercession on our behalf. But he said, I was going to send the Holy Spirit, that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will abide with you forever, and he will reveal all things to you. He will take from me and reveal to you. So today, we have the Holy Spirit of God to be able to help us. He's here to help us, to take us back to the garden so that we can take our rightful position. So the whole essence of Christmas is for us to get back to the garden, God's original intention for humanity. Once we realize that, how many times can we have Christmas in a year? Sorry? 365. That's good. Once we realize that every blessed day we drink of his love because God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. He gave him once. The answer is no. Because we are told that his love, the new word, every morning. That means that you can have Christmas every morning. That's where I'm going. Anytime you realize the love of God, you are having Christmas. Some people wait to celebrate Christmas on the 25th of December. So that means their own Christmas is once a year. But for a child of God, your Christmas ought to be every morning. And that explains why the psalmist that understood this principle said, early in the morning will I rise up and seek your face. Are you guys hearing me? So I expect that from today that you have your Christmas every morning. Every morning you partake of the bread of life. You wake up early in the morning and ask the Holy Spirit to fill you anew with the love of God. Because the love of God is what made Jesus Christ to come. And he came for one singular purpose, to take you back to the garden. Amen? to make sure that there is peace between you and God. That's why I love that song so much. For us to be able to walk with him, we must also learn to surrender everything, withholding nothing. 
That is the principle. You know, Jesus Christ, shortly before he died, in John chapter 14, you know what he said? He said that the prince of the power of the air cometh, but he had nothing in me. Have you ever bothered to ask yourself, what was it he was talking about having nothing in him? Do you know what he was talking about? He was talking about having the property of the devil in him. When you live in sin, you're having the property of the devil, and he will come for it. Are you following? When you live in resentment, resentment is the property of the devil. He will come for it. When you live in unforgiveness, unforgiveness is the property of the devil. He will come for it. When you live in bitterness, bitterness is the property of the devil. He will come for it. But Jesus Christ said that the prince of the power of the air cometh, but he had nothing in me. That tells you that the devil will continually attack you. And will betide you if you have his property, then he has the right to come to you. Remember, he walks to and fro. Doing what? Looking for somebody to destroy. He walks to and fro. His business is to be moving up and down, up and down. Have you ever wondered, why is he moving up and down? Do you think the devil likes wasting his time? No, he's moving up and down, searching for the people having his property. And if you have any of these things that I've mentioned, he will come for you. And we're told that when you pull down the hedge, the enemy, the serpent will strike. Who is the serpent? It's the devil. So God expects us every morning for us to drink of his love, for us to realize that the bread of life that is Jesus Christ came for the singular purpose of bringing us back to the garden. And you notice something? Because God is faithful, at the end of the day, you will have so much to thank him for. I don't know whether you realize it, and that was why he said, I'm going to bless your going out. I'm going to bless your coming back. When you rise up early in the morning and you commit your entire program, your entire life to him, which is what God expects us, especially in the new year, we must come to that point that we surrender everything to him before we set out each day. Whatever it is, surrender it to him. Withhold nothing from him. He said, when you acknowledge me, that I will do what? I will direct your path. We need that guidance like never before in the new year. Why am I saying new year? Because we have six days to go. But if, if I were you, starting from today, when you wake up tomorrow morning, before you set out, commit everything to him. Withhold nothing from him. Let him have everything. Okay? Whatever it is that is bothering you, let him have it. Drink of his love. Tell him, Father, I now realize that your love is from everlasting to everlasting. What it simply means is that at every nick of time, you can partake of his love. And how do you do that? You withhold nothing from him. As you acknowledge him as the God of all flesh, what he will do is that he will begin to order your steps. We will need it like never before in the new year. Because things are not going to get better. Things are going to get tougher. The security challenges are going to get worse. The economy is... It, it's true that they've been talking about the things they are going to do, but I can tell you for free 
those things cannot hold our economy. Virtually everything is in shambles. So we need to walk with the Spirit of God like never before. I'm not saying this to scare you, but we need to wake up early in the morning and hold on to Him, trusting Him to see us through the issues of the day, trusting Him to guide us through every step. But one thing I can assure you is that the rod of the wicked will never rest upon your Lord. Say amen to that. Amen. Why? Because God said, so that you will not put your hands into evil. The period will be so short, but we need to hold on to him. So there is nothing to worry about. All we need to do is for us to realize that we can have our Christmas every blessed day, every morning. Let's partake of his love because it's his love that prompted the coming of Jesus Christ. And God is always faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his word. When he says anything, he will do it. When he told Adam and Eve that any day you partake of this thing, you're going to die. Did it happen? Yeah? Any one of you, you're having your great-grandparents still alive? Huh? So God is faithful. At least you know what that is all about. That death that happened to your great-grandfather originated from what happened in Genesis. Chapter 3. It came as a result of disobedience. But you see, when we use the word disobedience, it's a big word. Do you know what really happened? The woman said, the devil deceived me. That means the devil caused me to doubt your word. I didn't take it serious. What am I saying this morning? When you study your Bible, any promise that you see there, any commandment that you see there, take it serious. Don't take it for granted because God is not a respecter of any human being. When he says anything, he is going to do it. He said, I'm now at peace with you. Yes, truly, he's at peace with you. But we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is to make sure that we don't have the property of the devil in our individual life at any time. Why? Because the enemy is walking to and fro, looking for who to destroy. So we must make it a commitment in this new year that we are not going to harbor the property of the devil. So that when he comes, he will have nothing in us. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Parks, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.